and uh, welcome to this uh, installment of the uh, Delta on the Move lecture series here at the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences. Um, I'm uh, Gassan Moazin, an assistant professor here at the Institute. And this particular lecture series, as the name uh, kind of suggests, looks at the historical development um, of the uh, Greater Bay Area um, and uh, kind of tries to bring together researchers uh, that work on this particular area um, historically or contemporarily. And so, um, yeah, that is what the, what the lecture series is about. Um, today, we are very happy to welcome uh, to the lecture series uh, Dr. Vivian Kong. Um, Dr. Kong is, uh, is currently uh, a lecturer in, at the University of Bristol. She received her BA and MPhil degrees from the University of Hong Kong, in fact, and then went to uh, Bristol for uh, her PhD. And as I said, um, that's also where she is based. And uh, now she has published uh, widely um, on uh, civil society, diaspora, and uh, diasporas, and uh, also the press in uh, in Hong Kong, in modern Hong Kong. And today we're very uh, happy that she, um, as I said, joins us. But she will be talking about her new book, in fact. Um, which just came out uh, with Cambridge University Press. Uh, the book is called Multiracial Britishness, Global Networks in Hong Kong, 1910 to 1945. So we're very excited um, that she's taking the time to talk to us about the book. Uh, before I hand things over to Dr. Kong, I should uh, talk briefly about the format. So uh, Dr. Kong is going to talk for roughly 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time uh, for uh, questions and answers. If you have any questions during the talk or during Q&A, please just uh, submit them through the Q&A button in Zoom and I'll then um, read them out uh, for Dr. Kong to um, reply to. Um, but I don't want to take up any more time. So uh, Vivian, if you're ready, please feel free to uh, start. Sure, thanks, Kazan. I'm just gonna share screen now. Um... I, I hope it works. <laughs> it does, yes. Great. Um, so, so thank you, Gazan. And I want to thank the IHSS for inviting me to do this book talk. I'm really honored to be able to speak at my alma mater, uh, where it, which is where actually I began to become interested in Hong Kong history. And I have to say, um, Hong Kong, you trained me well um, before I came to Bristol to do the research that resulted in the book that you're seeing on the screen right now. So I think from the title of the book, you can work out that it's about British identities, about how multiracial population in Hong Kong engage with um, Britishness. But this project really started um, with a question that I had in mind, which was, what did being British mean in Hong Kong? And I had this question because when I came to Bristol to start my PhD, um, what I actually wanted to write, like the thesis that I actually wanted to write at the time was um, on the British in Hong Kong. But then the more I read um, about pre-war Hong Kong, the more I realized that Britishness, like any other identities or forms of belonging, actually didn't have a clear cut definition. It was transient and fluid, and it could mean different things to different people at different times as well. And when people, uh, when historians talk about Britishness or British identities, they tend not to look at Hong Kong, even though Hong Kong had been a British colony for more than 150 years. In many ways, it's not hard for us to understand why that was the case. Because under British colonial rule, um, racial discrimination was very stark in Hong Kong at the time. Uh, many times it seemed that Britishness um, was only defined as a race. British um, was only defined as a racial category and British identities had nothing to do with the wider uh, colonial population in Hong Kong. But as I did my uh, doctoral research and as I demonstrate in the book and as I will do in the talk today, in fact, I found that different segments of Hong Kong's um, population did engage with Britishness, and they defined Brit uh, being British as not only a racial category, but other forms of belonging as well. And when I, talk when I talked about different segments of Hong Kong's population, um, the population that we're dealing with is actually um, a very multiracial one. 
as many of you would know, Hong Kong was and still is a, a multiracial city. Living in Hong Kong were not only the ethnic majority, the Chinese um, or white Britons, but also other groups such as Eurasian, um, the Portuguese, or as we call them today, the Macanese community, um, a sizable um, population of South Asians, as well as other Europeans, such as Germans, the French, Russians, Americans, and, and Japanese, and so on. And I really want to highlight this racial diversity, because it's this racial diversity that allow Hong Kong um, to, be, um, to be a very excellent site for us to understand how cultural diversity of the British Empire shaped the development of British identities. Although historians in existing publications have acknowledged and explored how cross-cultural interactions have enriched the meaning of being British, before my book, um, our conversation have been limited primarily to um, exploring how one indigenous group in a colonial context interacted with white Britons there. Um, and so I want to overcome this limitation of existing publications. So my book explores how different racial communities in Hong Kong engage with Britishness um, and underscore that these different communities actually coexisted with each other and think about how their interactions with one another um, enriched, stretched and complicated the meaning of being British. To do so, I look at different sources, and these sources include colonial documents, um, newspapers, um, especially um, also uh, letters to editors um, from anonymous readers as well. I also looked at student publications, such as the Hong Kong New Student Union magazine, um, institutional, sorry, institutional records of um, different um, civil civic associations, as well as uh, memoirs and autobiographies. And I also did oral history interviews with um, former residents of Hong Kong as well. Through looking, consulting these different sources, I found that in 1910 to 1945 Hong Kong, Britishness actually existed in multiple hyphenated form. It meant many different things. As I said, in many, at, in, at, at many times, it was understood as a racial category, um, but actually, because Hong Kong was a British colony, being British would be helpful, it could bring one um, convenience and privileges. So for many people in Hong Kong, it was also understood as a means to obtain privileges or convenience that would be essential for survival in the British colony. What's perhaps more surprising to many people is that despite racial discrimination, Britishness was also developed into a national identity and a form of cultural belonging that people of color living in the colony also possessed. Sometimes residents of Hong Kong also define Britishness as a cosmopolitan sensibility. Um, they thought that being British meant that they were being cosmopolitan as well. And I'm going to talk a, a little bit more on that later. But when I realized that being British meant so many different things in Hong Kong before the Second World War, I can't help but also started wondering more questions. One of the questions was, who were the people that actually engaged with these different notions of Britishness? And when how and why did they do so? And as I think about how they engage with Britishness, I also thought, were there any problems for them to engage with Britishness? Especially as um, many of them would have other existing um, notes of belonging as well. How did that interact with their existing identities such as Chineseness or the Macanese identity, et cetera? So in different chapters of my book, I address these different questions and, and think about, you know, different forms of, of British identities. For instance, in chapter one, um, British by law, I looked at how Britishness existed in Hong Kong as a legal identity and how those in Hong Kong engage with um, the legal Britishness. 
in the period that I deal with in the book, according to British nationality law, which you can see on the screen here, all those born and naturalized within the territory of British Empire would be entitled to the status of British, uh, British subject. So this means that a Chinese person um, who was born in Hong Kong to Chinese parents, legally speaking, should be as British as a white Briton who was born in London to white British parents. And legally speaking, they would have the same kind of rights in Britain and in Hong Kong as British subjects. Um, and these included the right to enter and to live in the UK. But in practice, Racism often prompted officials um, to think that if one wasn't born to British, white British parents, they can't be fully British. And so these officials uh, would often ignore the fact that these um, colonial subjects in Hong Kong actually had um, British subjecthood. And they would try really hard to prevent colonial subjects in Hong Kong to know about their legal status and to make use of the rights that comes with this legal status as British subjects. So here, for instance, um, you're looking at a document from 1933 where Whitehall officials um, mentioned that there's been this existing policy where colonial authorities in Hong Kong were instructed to issue only travel certificates rather than a full uh, passport to Chinese residents in Hong Kong. And this was done to prevent um, Chinese residents of Hong Kong to use a full British passport to enter the UK. And this is just one of the many examples I can find in documents or in the news about how um, the state officials tried to um, obstruct colonial subjects in Hong Kong from using their British subjecthood. But paradoxically, even with these um, racist policies in place, with state officials trying their best to prevent and obstruct British subjects in Hong Kong to know and to use their rights as British subjects. I found that in 1920s onwards, uh, more and more Hong Kong residents were actually becoming aware of their legal status as British subjects, and they would make active use of these status as well. And they made active claims to this status for various reasons. Um, and the most obvious one is perhaps, as I said, Hong Kong was a British colony. Um, having a British status would just make your life so much easier. Um, you can travel more easily to places like Singapore, um, but you can also um, enjoy certain privileges um, in, the, in the public world or in the commercial world as well. So it's not hard for us to understand why many colonial elites, such as Wong Sing, Sir Ho Kai, Sir Wai Yo, or Sir Robert Ho Tung, um, who would want to thrive in Hong Kong's commercial and public world, would very publicly declare that they were British subjects and they would make active use of this status in the commercial and public world of Hong Kong. But I also found evidence that it wasn't just those in the upper middle class in Hong Kong that made use of legal Britishness. Here, for instance, um, I'm showing you an evidence of a cook um, called A Lo Lo Wing, um, who is from Hong Kong, who was living in the UK at the time and wanted to apply for naturalization as British subject um, so that he could live in Britain. But as I said, um, anyone born in Hong Kong when it was a British colony would be a um, British subject by law. The Home Office later realized that Alo Lo Wing was actually born in Kowloon Town uh, when Kowloon was already a, um, a British colony. So he was in fact a British subject by birth and had no need to be naturalized. But I think his case is really interesting here, right? Because A, it tells us that um, even someone in the working class would um, have the desire to engage with Britishness, but also B, that they have very limited knowledge about the, um, the legal, their legal status. And I should say that Alo Lo Wing actually went to the UK for some years before this already. 
Um, and so um, this is a case that shows us how um, those in the working class would also want to engage with Britishness. At the same time, the population census of 1931 also recorded more than 270,000 Chinese residents that were reported to be British subjects. With this and a few other cases in the archive where I found um, British, uh, where I found colonial subjects in Hong Kong um, applying to, to deploy their, their rights as British subjects, it shows that by the 1930s, there was a growing awareness within the wider colonial population about the fact that, um, you know, to be born and naturalized in Hong Kong made one legally British. And so, um, and this legal British status can give one the basis to engage further with other notions of Britishness. And so in the following chapters, I turn to examine um, the possibilities and challenges for colonial subjects to acquire other forms of Britishness. In chapter three, for instance, I've been looking at the screen, you would know that uh, what is the case study of, of my chapter three here. And yes, this is our beloved Hong Kong U. In this chapter, I focus on the experience of ethnic Chinese students um, who studied at Hong Kong U um, before the Second World War to examine how cultural Britishness affected the lived experience of Chinese diasporas in Asia in the 20th century. I think many of us here probably already know that Hong Kong U was actually founded with a very explicit agenda to advance British imperial interests in China. Founders of the university wanted Hong Kong U to educate Chinese students and mainly Chinese students from mainland China. Um, and they wanted the university to teach these students not just Western knowledge, but more importantly, British values. So then after studying at Hong Kong U, they would have this appreciation for British system, British culture, and British values. And then after their graduations, they could become missionaries of the British Empire. They envisioned that these graduates would then return to China and work in the Chinese government, and then make the Chinese government more inclined to British system, British um, you know, commercial industries, um, and, and British values. Um, and they thought this could help counteract the growing imperial influences that Japan, Germany, and the United States had in China at the time. So apart from teaching Western knowledge and British values, a great emphasis um, of the university administration and of the colonial officials in establishing Hong Kong U was also placed on steering the students away from Chinese nationalism because they wouldn't want the students to become radical um, and, and so inspired by nationalist sentiments that um, they would prefer not to work uh, with British colonial or imperial interests. And so in this chapter, um, chapter three, through student magazines and, and memoirs of graduates, I examine how, it intro uh, how the indoctrination of cultural Britishness left very visible social effects on Chinese students at Hong Kong U, and how um, colonial education at Hong Kong U shaped the way they responded to Chinese anti-colonial movements as well. I think one thing I should say about Hong Kong U um, before the Second World War was that although the founders wanted Hong Kong U to educate mostly mainland Chinese students, the historical reality was that before the Second World War, Mainland students were the minority on campus. As you can see from this pie chart here, in 1940, um, mainland students accounted for only 27% of the Chinese student population on campus. The majority uh, was Hong Kong Chinese and very closely followed by overseas Chinese um, who were mainly from the Strait settlements. These different origins meant that when students, when Chinese students came to Hong Kong U, they already had received different um, level of exposure to Western and uh, mainly British political and cultural influence. 
they would have different inclination towards um, Chineseness and towards Britishness as well. The cover image of my book, um, which is a photo of the Faculty of Arts in the 1920s, actually can give us a pretty good sense of these cultural differences um, um, within its ethnic Chinese popula uh, student population as well. So as you can see from the photo here, some of them wore Chinsam, uh, wore Qipao, um, but, but for most of them wore suits, some even had bow ties on, um, and you can you can get a sense of these sort of cultural practices um, going on amongst the student population there. And for most of these students that uh, you know, like coming to Hong Kong U, studying at Hong Kong U, was actually the very first time they got to interact with other Chinese individuals who would understand and identify with um, a Chinese identity or different. Um, forms of Britishness um, in a very significant degree. And interacting with these, um, you know, ch other ethnic Chinese who, who understood and identified with Chineseness and Britishness differently made them reflect on what it meant to be Chinese and what it meant to be British. Uh, and more importantly, what it meant to be a Chinese living in a British colony. So um, I looked at student magazines and I found that like a lot of students actually would complain or like, you know, it's 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 very obvious that they were getting upset about how so-called westernized um, their Chinese peers were at Hong Kong U. So the quote at the bottom of the screen here, you can see there's a quote um, that's like quite a gendered um, critic of um, Chinese girls adopting English names. So I think the author of this quote, um, it, uh, I, I found it in a union magazine. I, I think the student probably wouldn't like my name very much. Um, and then the quote about it, um, it's when a student um, criticized that the peers had no interest in learning more about Chinese language and Chinese culture. And these observations on the Western inclination of Hong Kong students also took place at the time when um, there were there was rising nationalism in China. In 1925, in particular, um, there were anti-imperialist protests in China, uh, in in Shanghai, um, and it triggered the May 30th movement after police officers under British command opened fire at Chinese protesters and killed some of them at the scene. Um, and it triggered a wave of protests um, against foreign, but especially British imperialism in um, many Chinese cities. During this movement, Chinese nationalist and anti-British sentiments were at peak. At the forefront of this May 30th movement were actually university students um, who organized marches and protests to advocate for the end of British imperial presence in China. But this wasn't the case for Hong Kong U students. In fact, um, in Hong Kong in June 1925, a strike boycott also started in Hong Kong. More than hundreds of thousands of Chinese left Hong Kong in protest. So university staff and colonial officials were really worried that um, these protests would affect uh, Chinese students at Hong Kong U. They would be mobilized by these um, anti-colonial sentiments as well. But, uh, you know, a big surprise to everyone was that these um, students at Hong Kong U remained really cooperative with the colonial administration and with, with university administration. No march, no protest took place on campus. Almost no students attended any of the political protests at, uh, in Hong Kong. Some students even actively helped the local government maintain its medical services. And during the strike boycott at the May Hall, uh, which I believe is the heck, you know, is the home of the IHSS actually, student residents even arranged a play for an audience that included the governor of Hong Kong. And so the vice chancellor at the time, whose picture you can see on the screen here, he in fact remarked that students were perfectly docile and more amenable to discipline than he had ever known them. 
And I think it's it's quite something to come from a vice chancellor of a university. The VC thought the students were um, the, 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 the VC thought that was because students were just grateful to be back on campus of this imperial university. And I think this provides us some insight to understand how Chinese students at Hong Kong do responded to anti-imperialist sentiments in China. As I said, um, this the response that they gave um, to, to anti-colonial movements in China was very unusual compared to what was happening on university campuses in mainland China. Many noticed this very unusual response. Um, for instance, observers um, at the time, you know, wrote remarks on this, but also students at Hong Kong U themselves noticed this unusual response. The student editor of the 1927 Student Union magazine actually wrote this quote you can see on the screen here, which suggests how strange they found that their student body was not very enthusiastic about what was happening in China at the time. Even the students themselves found their peers seemingly apathetic response to the May 30th movement quite surprising. At the first glance, this seems to show us that ethnic Chinese students at Hong Kong U didn't quite care about Chinese nationalism. But that wasn't entirely true either. Students actually sometimes express very overtly um, patriotic sentiments for the Chinese Republic. In 1920, for instance, um, a student was inspired by the May 4th movement um, and the student who was a scholarship student from mainland China, he actually started a strike on Hong Kong U campus um, and he wanted, uh, he started to strike because he wanted the university to allow them to mark 10th of October, which in the student's words was the national day of our country, referring to the Republic of China as a university holiday. They wanted the university to allow them to celebrate um, the Chinese National Day um, on that day. And his strike, his campaign actually gathered widespread support from students across the campus, which gradually pressured the university authorities um, to make 10th of October a university holiday and allow students to celebrate it on campus every year. Um, and so on the screen, you see, you can see a picture, you know, eight years later of um, the double 10th celebration, the, the 10th of October celebration organized by the student union at Hong Kong U. You can also see a poem um, written in 1927 by a student who presumably uh, spoke Cantonese um, because the title of the poem is a romanization of the Cantonese pronunciation of Zhonghua Ruo Zhonghua Ruo which means China, my country. Just from the title, you can, you can sense that there's a strong identification with the Chinese Republic. And these sentiments um, became more visible among student publication after the Japanese launches full-scale invasion of China in 1937. For instance, um, you can see on the right-hand side of, of, of the screen um, a quote um, from 1940 when a student wrote um, that, you know, university student, the society needs you, the nation needs you, trying to mobilize um, their peers at Hong Kong U to support Chinese war effort. So what do we make with all of these, you know, different examples, different stories? I think the experiences of Hong Kong U students here actually show us how the dissemination of Britishness and in fact, the very presence of British colonialism in East Asia shaped the different ways in which ethnic Chinese living outside mainland China engage with rising Chinese nationalism at the time. As we see from the examples above, Hong Kong U students clearly did identify with China to a certain degree, they call China my country, they celebrated the National Day, and they supported Chinese war effort. But at the same time, they also demonstrated little enthusiasm towards nationalist populism, an attitude that contrasted so much with their counterparts in mainland China that it surprised even the students themselves. 
This attitude was in fact shaped by the colonial environment in Hong Kong, Hong Kong and, and, and Hong Kong's colonial status. For the students um, from mainland China, some of them actually wrote in their memoir that they were very conscious of the fact that they were living in a British colony at the time. Even though they felt very strongly about um, the nationalist movements in China at the time, they felt that they were in a foreign land and that they shouldn't cause trouble in other people's land. That's exactly what they wrote in the memoir. Um, and, and, and this was especially true for many of them who came to Hong Kong um, on scholarship, who came to Hong Kong U on scholarship because they worried about causing trouble would cause them their scholarship and interrupt or disrupt their, their study at Hong Kong U. For students who could afford to go to Hong Kong U on their own funds, most of them come from Hong Kong and um, Malaya and they were largely from an affluent social background. Existing works um, in Hong Kong history have already suggested that for many of the colonial middle class in Hong Kong at the time, they believed that Chinese nationalism would harm their economic interest. And so that's why when the strike boycott happened in Hong Kong, they decided to work with the colonial government so then they could steer Hong Kong away from these sentiments. Likewise, the largely affluent um, and diasporic background of Hong Kong U students um, combined with the curriculum of the university encourage many of these students to believe that British colonial rule would benefit Hong Kong more than Chinese nationalism. And so this encouraged them um, to sympathize very little with Chinese anti-colonial movements. The experience of these students then suggests that on one hand, colonial education made Chinese in British territories more receptive to British colonial rule and less responsive to Chinese nationalism. But on the other hand, British domination in Asia also made many feel that they didn't really have the option to engage freely and actively with Chinese nationalism. The colonial environment of Hong Kong and its officials' conscious attempts to indoctrinate cultural Britishness gave birth to a non-radicalism towards nationalist movements. It helps us see how British colonial rule affected the development of Chinese identities as well. At Hong Kong U, we see a group of colonial subjects who are not only engaging Britishness for its functions, who are not only engaging it to survive in the colony. The way these students dress, the way they decided on the names they go by, the pride they took in being British educated in an age of nationalism also suggests to us a conscious choice of identifying with cultural Britishness. It's interesting to see how Britishness interacted with their other existing uh, notes of belonging, especially Chineseness. Day-to-day -day interactions with other ethnic Chinese with different cultural practices um, and who identify with Chineseness differently to the ways they do, encourage them to reflect on what it meant to be Chinese, what it meant to be a Chinese that adopted Western cultural practices, and what it meant to be a Chinese to be British educated as well. Their engagements with Britishness encouraged many of them to see Chineseness and Britishness as forms of belonging beyond mere national identities. But some of the quote that I show you where they criticize the Western inclination of their peers, perhaps also show us that some fail to appreciate that identities and belonging could operate beyond a very clear national framework. And that is why some would criticize that their classmates lacked a sense of exclusive national belonging to China. This viewpoint was actually not unusual in interwar Hong Kong especially if we also turn to look at the experience of the Portuguese community. So the, the Portuguese community is um, the, the focus of, my fourth, of the fourth chapter of my book. But before I tell you a little bit more about what I um, talked about in the chapter, I should tell you a little bit about the Portuguese community. So this community today, we're more likely to call them Macanese. 
um, they are descendants of the Portuguese who came from Portugal um, in uh, since the 16th century uh, to Asia, who intermarried with Asians and settled in Asia. Um, these interracial, um, this interracial community, some of its members settled in Macau, um, you know, hundreds of years ago, um, and in since the mid 18th century, because of economic opportunities, but also because of natural disaster in Macau, many of them moved to Hong Kong um, since the mid 18th century. Because of the interracial background, they were never seen as part of the so-called European population in Hong Kong um, because they were not uh, for, for the European population at the time. They thought that only those who were white could be part of the European population. So the Portuguese community was excluded from that community because of their Portuguese background, even though um, they were you know, interracial um, subjects, they were also seen as a distinct community from the Eurasian community as well. Um, in many ways, they had very different cultural practices from the Eurasian community. Many of the first generation of the Portuguese community um, who came to settle in Hong Kong, they would speak Patois um, as the first language. So Patois is a Creole language that was based on Portuguese, but also mixed with, um, you know, different hints of Cantonese, Malay, and Sinhala, and other, other Chinese language, uh, other Asian languages as well. And in chapter four, um, I looked at the Portuguese community to investigate um, the long acculturation process that gave them an attachment to imperial belongings and cultural Britishness as well. One thing I should emphasize here is that the Portuguese, they weren't necessarily passive recipients within the process. They also took some active role, especially um, um, in, in engaging with Britishness. Many of them um, started doing so for practicalities. Um, many Portuguese parents, for instance, they were conscious of the fact that they were now living in a British colony. And so they believed that it was really important that the children could speak fluent English. Um, and so this is why, um, although they would send them to school run by Catholic missions, um, they would know to send their children to Catholic schools that taught in English, even though there were also Catholic schools that taught in Portuguese. In particular, almost all the Portuguese boys who grew up in pre-war Hong Kong, they would have gone to um, St. Joseph's College, and for those in Kowloon, they would have gone to La Salle College. What's so special about these schools is that Unlike those who were instructed, at, unlike the schools that were instructed in Portuguese, students at St. Joseph's and, and La Salle included not just Portuguese children. They also included Chinese, Eurasian, and even white British children. So the school curriculum and the extracurricular activities that the students can join at the school, they were catered not only for Hong Kong Portuguese, but for all residents of Hong Kong. They taught students not only knowledge, but more importantly, they taught students how to be a citizen within the British colony. So while these Portuguese students and started engaging cultural Britishness for better chance of survival, they would end up acquiring not just a proficiency in English, but also you know, cultural um, Britishness, but also actually national um, belonging to Britishness as well. The schools would make them sing God Save the King. Um, you know, the national anthem was even um, part of the um, you know, recital dictation um, for many of these school children. At the schools, they would become boy scouts and they would learn about the words of Biden Powell and they would vow to serve the British sovereign. There were also other activities that sort of tried to indoctrinate them a sense of belonging to the British Empire as well. And these included the Empire Day celebration every year um, where they would have a writing competition. So in 1918, for instance, um, we can on the screen, we can see um, an essay that won the competition 
where the student reflect on what it meant to be part of the British Empire, that we think of the British Empire and all of that it implies not just its so-called greatness and benefits, but also the obligation and the responsibility. And of course, I, you know, I don't think we should assume that just because a student wrote an essay like this, um, they necessarily believed in every single word that they wrote. You know, there's the chance that they did genuinely believe it, but there's also a chance that they were just writing these essays um, and they didn't believe in it. But even so, even they wrote the essay just for the sake of winning a competition. This tells us something. This tells us that they have this clear, a, a student in a school had this clear consciousness, awareness that they were, they were a subject of the British Empire. After spending years in the school, um, students, um, the Hong Kong Portuguese, they would develop a clear awareness that they were a subject of the British Empire, that they were not just Portuguese, but Hong Kong Portuguese, and more importantly, British Portuguese. Although they started engaging with Britishness primarily for survival in the colony, as that case went by, these engagements undoubtedly made them subjects of the British colony. Most of them were entitled to a legal British status. They, they now spoke more English than Batois and Portuguese, and they would call themselves loyal British subjects and demonstrate their loyalty in very practical ways as well. Many Portuguese men actually volunteered themselves for military service in the British colony because they felt that uh, Hong Kong was their home, that they, you know, they were citizen, they were resident of this British colony. And so it was their responsibility to serve in the defense of the British Empire. There was even an influential few that served in Hong Kong's public sphere, in the sanitary boards, um, in the urban council um, and in the legislative council, for instance, that they served for the British administration. But like many identities, being British was multifarious, it's transient, and it's hyphenated identities as well. And this created problems for the Hong Kong Portuguese. For many Hong Kong Portuguese who acquire Britishness, they face a dilemma. On one hand, they face um, very visible rejection from the colonial states. Although at the time, uh, in interwar years in Hong Kong, some white Britons began to see colonial subjects as part of being British as well, racist idea of Britishness as a racial identity still lingered on in the colony. The colonial say in particular, very rarely fully accepted Portuguese to be British subjects. And institutional discrimination against them was just too obvious for them to ignore. Here you're looking at the picture of Adi Gosano, who was actually a surgeon who received his medical training at Hong Kong U. In his memoir, he wrote about how although he was born in Hong Kong, although he was a legal British subject by birth, his racial background meant that he received a significantly lower salary package than he would have received if he was white. He wrote that his wage was only a quarter of his Irish counterpart. Um, and no wonder he would write in, um, in his memoir many years later that it was, as a doctor would be inclined to say, a better pill to swallow. While they face uh, rejection from the colonial state, um, some Portuguese in Hong Kong, especially those who held a closer connection with Macau and the, the authorities in Macau, would feel that the Portuguese in Hong Kong were becoming too British. And so this acculturation process to Britishness put the Hong Kong Portuguese in a very difficult position where they on one hand face discrimination and mistrust from the colonial authorities in Hong Kong, but on the other, they face backlash from the wider Portuguese diasporas who now thought that the Hong Kong Portuguese were betraying their Macanese cultural heritage. This led to tensions and bitterness and even sometimes public open criticism targeted against the Hong Kong Portuguese. But despite all these issues, it was clear that by the interwar years, 
many colonial subjects in Hong Kong developed a sense of belonging to British national identity. They chose to identify with this national belonging, and they genuinely believed that British colonialism would benefit Hong Kong more than Chinese nationalism. And so in the next chapter, I focus on Hong Kong's multiracial civil society. And I, and I explore how middle-class urbanites in Hong Kong actively use associational culture to define and perform their Britishness. I focus on five voluntary societies with very different purposes and agendas. And these are Freemasonry, Rotary Club, the League of Fellowship, Kowloon Residents Association, and the Eugenics League. I examine how um, the urbanites in Hong Kong use the public culture to assert a version of Britishness that signaled being cosmopolitan, being benevolent, um, being civilized and civically engaged. They use associational culture to construct and actively promote their belief that British colonialism was beneficial to Hong Kong um, to counteract the influence that Chinese nationalism was um, imposing on Hong Kong at the time. And of course, for those of us who've seen, you know, like all these examples of racial discrimination, who have um, given a closer look to the history of the British Empire, we would know that this was a very insular, very fragile notion of Britishness, that it wouldn't hold up if we, you know, put it next to all this historical reality in the history of the British Empire. But nevertheless, we cannot deny that this rosy, incomprehensive notion of British colonialism, of British identities, they did exist in Hong Kong at the time. But the very, this very insular notion of Britishness was very soon put to test um, during the Second World War. In the, chapter, uh, in, in the next chapter, in chapter six, I draw on the interactions between the state and Hong Kong's colonial subjects to explore how the Second World War actually magnified the systemic discriminations that colonial subjects faced in Hong Kong and how it brought to light the fragility of the rhetoric of imperial cosmopolitanism and, and put the diverse forms of Britishness articulated in earlier years to a very severe test. I found that at times, cosmopolitan notions of, in, of Britishness did manifest itself, especially in the many relief, uh, in, in the relief scheme that British authorities put to some of the colonial subjects in Hong Kong. And this included the um, relief scheme that Professor Gordon King started and was assisted by other British authorities for Hong Kong new students to help the students escape from an occupied China. On the screen, you're seeing the list of one of the groups of students that escaped from Hong Kong and ended up in, um, in an occupied China through this relief scheme. This British relief scheme encouraged some of them to, to you know, to believe that um, the British state was being very nice to them and encouraged them to identify more strongly with Britishness. But for many others, it wasn't that they, they weren't that fortunate. The war actually made them see more vividly than ever the unfairness of British colonialism. And they were first made very clear of that in 1940 when the Hong Kong government excluded British subjects of color when they sent away 3,400 white British women and children from Hong Kong to Australia for safety precaution. And even after many colonial subjects fought for British war efforts after a war started in Hong Kong, that they risked their lives for it, many realized that the British state still questioned their Britishness and didn't fully accept that they were part of the British Empire. This was particularly so in the case of Hong Kong Portuguese. Many of them had family members, if not themselves, joining the Volunteer Defense Corps, fought for the British colony and, and lost their lives. Because of food shortage during Japanese occupation, Many of these Hong Kong Portuguese had to go to Macau as refugees and seek help from the British consul there. And amongst these included um, Adi Gosano, 
um, the doctor that we that the doctor that was trained at Hong Kong knew that we met earlier. So after he went to Macau, um, Eddie Gorsano, during the day, he worked as a doctor attached uh, in the cl clinic that was attached to the British Consul, and he would provide medical services um, to the uh, British subjects who came to the British Consul for you know, medical help. But he actually also lived a secret double life at the time. He was actually the head of the Macau branch of an organization called British Army Aid Group. And this was actually a unit under um, MI9 um, that organized uh, relief work and, and collected intelligen in, sorry, intelligence for the British um, military forces. And like many other members of the British Army Aid Group, Eddie Gosano took on very severe risks of his own safety and his family's safety to do this work for the British war efforts. But even so, he realized that the British state was still questioning the Britishness. He saw with his own eyes how um, the kind of sacrifices that they provided for the British state didn't necessarily result in equal treatment from the British state, that they were still... Um, not fully accepted as British subjects. Many of the Hong Kong Portuguese, when they sought relief from the British consul in Macau, they actually faced scrutiny that white Britons would not have faced um, from the, the authorities. And they were made accurately, accurately aware of the racism they experienced under British colonialism. And altogether, they started questioning their engagements with Britishness and eventually reached the conclusion that they would never be fully accepted as British and would gradually severe their connection with Britishness. And this was partly uh, why as many Hong Kong Portuguese decided to emigrate from Hong Kong in the 1950s and 60s, um, Britain wasn't where they considered to move to. If you looked at the migration trajectory of the Hong Kong Portuguese after the Second World War, most of them actually settled, <clears throat> most of them settled not in Britain, but in California, in Canada, and in Australia. So altogether, my book traces the longer history of Britishness in Hong Kong and explore how Hong Kong's multiracial population engage with Britishness and what sort of issues and challenges they face as they engage with Britishness. Does this longer history of Britishness in Hong Kong still matters now that British colonialism has long departed Hong Kong, now that Hong Kong is clearly not a British colony? I do think so, because this helps us understand why many in Hong Kong, whose parents and grandparents, if not themselves, would have experienced the unfairness of colonial hierarchies would actively um, deploy similar rhetoric and how rosy fragmented memories of the colonial days still lingered um, these days. Because this has much to do with the longer history of the transmission, but also the use of imperial cosmopolitanism in interwar Hong Kong. The different historic notions of Britishness mentioned in this book also matter beyond Hong Kong as well. Like the idea of identity or any identity category, Britishness is ambiguous, is an ambiguous concept that have varied and sometimes contradictory meanings. My book shows how, when and why individuals, especially people of color, experience tensions, bitterness and prejudice as they engage with different notions of Britishness. Many of these issues, these tensions and bitterness came down to the widely held neglect of the multifaceted nature of identity and belonging. Exploring the multiracial engagements with Britishness in Hong Kong helps us appreciate not only the compatibility of Britishness with other existing identities, but also issues that people of color face as they engage with this um, British identities. Thinking about the past and present of multiracial Britons in Hong Kong can allow us to think more critically about how and why post-colonial uh, post nationalism could, at times, 
being compatible with transnational, ethnic, and regional identities, as we see from the examples of the development of modern citizenship in South and Southeast Asia. And I realized the time, and I, I should stop soon, because of the time, I wasn't able to tell you in the same level of details about um, all these research findings I've had in some of the other chapters in my book. But if any of you is interested in learning more, as you can see, there's a 20% off discount. But I would also be very happy um, to answer any questions you might have about the book in the Q&A section as well. Um, thank you all for listening to me for so long. Yeah, thank you so much, Vivian, uh, for giving us this wonderful introduction to your book um, and uh, giving us such a wonderful introduction to all of the different chapters as well. Um, so as I said, we now have some time for questions. So if you have any questions uh, for Dr. Kong, please uh, post them in the Q&A or submit them to the Q&A box in Zoom and then on the Q&A button in Zoom, and um, I will um, then uh, read them out. Um, we actually already have the first question um, that comes from Jackie Hui, and the question is, is there any coverage of how Hong Kong Chinese um, reacted to China's major events, uh, for example, the fall of the Qing dynasty and warfare? And um, how did these events influence the British policy in Hong Kong, as well as eventually the Britishness of, China, of the Chinese in Hong Kong? Um, thanks, Jackie. That's a great question. Um, so in the book, um, so this was as, especially what I looked at in chapter three, um, the Hong Kong U chapter as well. Like I was trying to to look at how um, Hong Kong U students responded to, say, the May 4th movement, um, the May 30th movement, but also the outbreak of war with the Japanese in China. Um, and because the focus was more on how um, the residents in Hong Kong responded to these events. Um, I didn't necessarily look that much at how that influenced British policy in Hong Kong, but there was also, you know, I also looked at how, you know, how the colonial authorities expected um, people to react. Um, for instance, how I talked about, you know, the, the officials were actually quite worried that students would be mobilized and, and would go against them. But that didn't quite happen. Um, and, and, and I think other historians have also looked at, say, John Carroll in his book, he, he talked about how uh, some of the Chinese and Eurasian elites actually worked with the British to, um, to formulate strategies um, to, to help um, suppress the, the strike boycott in Hong Kong, for instance, in 1925 to 26. Um, eventually, how did these events influence the Britishness of Chinese in Hong Kong? I think sometimes these events made them reflect on, okay, what, what does being British mean and what whether it's helpful to be British at times like these. Um, and in the cases that I've looked at, I think many of them would prefer, um, it's not like they don't, sim they don't, sympathize with what was happening in China at the time. Um, but sometimes they don't necessarily think that the nationalist movements were um, helpful for China, that they thought that, you know, because of all the um, political chaos and upheavals going on in 1920s China, um, that they worry um, if Hong Kong get get more influenced by these sentiments, it would hurt their interests. And so that's why they decided to um, be even more focal about their Britishness and try to promote um, this rhetoric of what I call imperial cosmopolitanism, that which that was basically just asserting that it, you know, um, in British colonialism was beneficial um, to Hong Kong or to the British Empire um, and to all these other colonial territories as well. I hope this answers your question, but feel free to let me know if you have more. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I wanted to ask about is, I mean, I was fascinated um, when you showed this chart of the, um, of the student body of HKU in 1940, I think it was, and that there were so many um, I guess students that came from the you know Strait Settlement and Australia and so on. So I wonder whether the you could talk about how 
I mean, they must have carried some form of possible Britishness. You know, I I I assume they were Chinese, so they must have have kind of carried their own form of Britishness to their study at HKU. And so I wonder whether you could talk about you know how it might have been different from the from the local students they might have met in Hong Kong, and whether that there was any kind of interaction between these different forms of how they related to to Britain uh, in that sense. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for giving me the chance to to tell just a little bit more about the you know what what I found to be like really fascinating stories um, that these former students told of their life at Hong Kong U. Um, so I think the mainland students, especially, they wrote quite a lot about how they were surprised by how like so called westernized these overseas Chinese students were, and they wrote about how you know they were basically just the just English speaking. Um, that they, these um, overseas Chinese students, especially those from um, the Strait settlements, um, I think it's very rare for them to be able to speak Mandarin. Um, they might speak um, the dialect of where, you know, generations ago their ancestors were from. So a lot of them were Hokkien speaking, actually. Um, but they didn't speak Cantonese, um, and, but they, speak, they spoke really, really good English. And so I, I found testimonies where um, Hong Kong and mainland Chinese students would comment on how oh, they feel very self-conscious when they talk to these overseas Chinese students, that they spoke really fluent English and, and they could hardly catch up. Um, some of the mainland students also wrote about how um, when they had just casual conversation with these um, Malayan students, um, the Malayan students would say to them, oh, you Chinese, blah, 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 blah. And they made a remark about how that suggested that um, these ethnic Chinese students from the Strait Settlement didn't necessarily see themselves as Chinese. And I think it was very eye-opening uh, for, for, for the Hong Kong Chinese and the mainland Chinese students um, at Hong Kong U. Um, and of course, you know, like living, studying, hanging out with uh, students with very different cultural practices would lead to stereotypes and prejudice as well. Um, and, and so I think there's a, uh, there's, there was this like published edited volume on, on Hong Kong U um, and, and there's this chapter um, where um, a, a, a scholar actually talked about how, um, you know, like, oh, Hong Kong Chinese students would 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 think uh would, would think would remark on how the mainland Chinese students, some of them still wear Chan Sam and all that. Um, and others would think that, oh, uh, some of these students were, you know, they care more about books than other activities, whereas other students would think that, oh, like the Hong Kong students, they don't really study that much. So there there are these stereotypes and um and images as well that I found quite interesting to read about because I went to Hong Kong U myself and it, you know, it's, things are a bit different um, compared to when, you know, in the period that I was looking at. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Um, we have another question that comes from uh, uh, Du Yufei. And the question is, thank you for the amazing storytelling. Uh, can you also comment on the roles of churches, specifically, or especially the Anglican church, in shaping Hong Kong Chinese's uh, Britishness? Thank you, Yuve. That's a good question. I'm going to be honest with you. I It, it, isn't, a, it isn't the focus of my book. Um, um, and that's partly because... Um, as a historian, you know, I tried to secure my work with existing literature as well. And I know that there's a lot of wonderful work done in other colonial contexts about, um, you know, Anglican church and its role in transmitting Britishness. And so in my book, I, you know, look at a more sort of surprising case, the, the Catholic um, schools in Hong Kong, right? I think for many people, that's quite surprising. I do know though, um, the Anglican Church in Hong Kong has a really good archive. Um, and so, you know, there's room for us to explore more, um, to think about. Um, I, I, I actually am quite interested in, in the sort of uh, philanthropic work that the Anglican Church did in engaging with um, um, the working class in Hong Kong as well. So that's something that I 
I hope to be able to tell you more in the future, but I'm going to be honest, I, I didn't really uh, talk about that in my own book here. Yeah, thank you. Um, we've got another question from uh, Maurice Kong. Um, the question is, or the question says, thank you for your presentation. Um, I saw the diversity of ethnicities. Um, I would like to ask, how do you look at the concept of the web proposed by Peter Hall? Um, who used it, I suppose, to explain the Eurasian in Hong Kong. So that's a quite a specific question about a particular, particular work, I suppose. Yes, it is. Um, I love I love that book. It's really helpful for me, um, especially at. Um, so you can see that in chapter five, I dealt with like multiracial civic um, Britishness, and actually. Um, so the subjects of that chapter, well, it's not just Eurasian, um, are not just Eurasians, but thinking about how um, the middle class professionals um, and, and, and business elites in Hong Kong, actually, how they interact with each other and how there's like cross-cultural interaction. And I found that it's actually, you know, um, and I talked about how I looked at five different associations, right? But what I found was that actually the members, while these associations have very different activities and agenda, the members of the membership of these um, associations actually overlap to a very large extent. Um, and so there's this, you know, like if we think beyond the Eurasian community, there's also another layer of the WAP going on. Um, in the civics uh, in the civil society in Hong Kong at the time, um, and it's quite helpful in the sense that, like, if you think about how these people interact with each other and how actually um, cross cultural solidarity emerge through their um, business, but also through their civic work, um, and 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 how that you know how it. It's, it's participating in this web that allowed them to engage with Britishness more, but also in engaging with the web, they were also promoting their belief of their sense, their understanding of Britishness in a very public manner. Um, so that's how that's how I, I'm understanding the concept of web as well. Um, and because the book is look at, looking at, you know, cultural diversity in Hong Kong, um, so I don't just look at Eurasians. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, there's actually another question, a follow-up question from Maurice. Um, and uh, the question is, what do you think about Eura Eurasians who claim, them, claim themselves as Chinese rather than British? For instance, Irene Ho, the daughter of um, Wotong, um, can we consider can we consider, I suppose, the aspect of, of gender for the female Eurasian, or like, for example, the tension between ethnicity and gender? Hmm. Interesting question. So I think one, um, so one of the very important messages that I'm trying to tell with the book, it's that, you know, my point isn't really on whether someone is fully fully British, fully Chinese, or fully Macanese, or fully Eurasian, but that you know identities are hyphenated, they coexisted um, at the same time. So you know, like for me, like thinking about like what's interesting is to think about why and how did someone um, express the like a, a particular form of their identity at a particular time but what what caused it what triggered it right um and I didn't really because I'm you know I'm aware of the wonderful work that has already been done on um Eurasian women such as um work by uh, Vicky Lee uh and Emma Tan as well um so I haven't really you know like talked about it in great details in the book but one thing I did reflect on was that, you know, the Portuguese, uh, the chapter on the British Portuguese, um, because of sources, a lot of the voices that I managed to engage with in the book, um, in, in that chapter was only the voices of Portuguese men, but not so much of Portuguese women. Again, that has to do with the availability of sources, but I do wonder if that it's also telling us something about gender, 
and um and acquisition of Britishness in um colonial societies as well. Oh interesting. Yeah. Um yeah, thank you. Um are there any questions? There was one question, but I asked for clarification so that it wasn't quite clear. Um, one question I have, I wonder whether, um, I don't know, that might go beyond um, what you do in the book, but of course, the, the period you cover also covers the Japanese occupation of, mm -hmm. uh, of Hong Kong. So, um, and I suppose the Japanese one, I mean, they had a sort of their own particular identity or, you know, obviously pan-Asian identity that they wanted to uh, kind of uh, propagate. So I wonder, you know, how, you know, whether you look at this at all and, you um, what exactly happens during the during the occupation? Yeah, so that isn't something that I, you know, focus particularly on in the book, but um, because of the, the wonderful work that Philip Snow had already done in his book, um, he did talk a little bit about that, like how Hong Kong's um, different segments of Hong Kong's colonial population responded to this like Pan-Asian rhetoric, right? Um, and, you know, some, Elites responded quite enthusiastically towards that, Be and and that's precisely because of the unfairness um, that they experienced under British colonial rule. Um, but you know there was also a great number of them that were uh, that were quite clear that you know this is just a rat trick. Um, you know the reality is quite different. Um, my chapter actually, you know, looked at it from a different, you know, it's, it's still looking at it, but like from a slightly different angle, like by reflecting on how um, the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, the more widely British Asia sort of um, disrupted the colonial hierarchy, right? Mm. And um and actually what I found was that a you know it definitely debunked the myth of like British uh supremacy. Um it, you know, it it did lose many, many battles. Um, but also on one hand, it made colonial subjects, as I said, um become acutely aware of, you know, how of 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 the unfair treatment that the British state was giving them, um, but on the other hand, it, it was you know because of the war and because of the sacrifices that these um, colonial subjects were making for the British Empire, um, it made a greater number of white Britons um, realize how you know like how British their colonial counterparts were and that they actually did a lot uh, they started going above and beyond to to you know to to help defend these colonial subjects rights as British subjects um some of the some of the memoirs I encountered I, I found during the research actually suggest to me that it was during the war that made these people aware of um, and 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 these people tend these white Britons tend to be, um, you know, again professionals um, and middle class um, white collar class who, you know, before the Second World War, they already had um, opportunities to work side by side with educated Asian professionals um, every single day. So they would have a fair, you know, like deal of interaction with them already and during the war um they they could see with their own eyes how you know how how obvious racial discrimination was um but how these people despite you know all these unfair treatment they still worked very hard for the british um and so um it made them reflect on how unfair british colonialism was it made these white britons realize that and actually um, that's why after the Second World War, you can see that the racial hierarchy in Hong Kong changed. You know, um, some of these still persist, but um, that's why the hierarchy changed quite drastically um, after the Second World War. That's really interesting, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, do we have any any other any other questions? In the audience? I think if not, then what remains for me to do um, is to thank you so much for taking the time uh, to uh, give us a talk about your book and introduce your book to us. Um, as we've mentioned, uh, the book is well, actually, so the book, I have it here actually, the book is just out from uh, Cambridge University Press. Um, so please have a look. Uh, I'm sure particularly after the talk, you're all um, very keen on, on, on um, properly reading it. Um, and having a look at it, so please do that. Um, yeah, and once again, uh, again, thank you so much for taking the time um, and giving us such an enjoyable talk. No, yeah, thank you, IHSS, for for having me. Thank you for your moderation and uh, moderating, and and thanks the audience for making the time to come to the talk as well. Thank you all so much. Yeah, thanks of course to everyone who who tuned in. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks so much. Cheers. Thank All you. Right. All right. Bye-bye.